Yes, okay. Okay. Welcome to all of you. I'm very excited about today's event on the Poets' Corner. I'm joined by poet and photographer Meg Weston, right before our eyes, along with Sig Harvey, who's right here. Hi, Sig. And Richard Wright Smith. Hi, Richard. Uh, Sig is an internationally known artist of images and language. And Richard is an artist, designer, and chair of the book arts program at Maine Media Workshops and College. They each will share their work and talk about the decisions and processes that go into making a book. I've worked with both Sig and Meg, and I admire and appreciate their ability to integrate the visual and the literary. And I'm so looking forward to listening to Richard describe how he brings work like Sig's and Meg's to print. As many of you know, the Poets Corner was founded by myself and Meg Weston to create and expand community among writers and readers of poetry and short prose. We invite people to read who have a connection to Maine, to read and to share about their process as writers. Our next event at the Poets Corner will be on the second Sunday of April, on April 11th. We'll have, enough, we'll have 10 poets who are published in the anthology, Enough, poets, Poems of Resistance and Protest. This book, edited by Claire Milliken and Agnes Bushnell, was published in late 2020 by Literal Books and addresses main poets' responses to issues of systemic racism and economic injustice. It will be a thoughtful and thought-provoking event. Don't miss it. After the artists today have shared, we will be open for questions from the chat. One of us will be scanning the chat during, during our discussion period, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions as possible. Just a reminder that we will be recording today's event, so if you don't want your image to appear in the recording, please turn off your video. The recording will be available on our website later this week. Okay. And we're going to start today with Sig Harvey. Okay, hi everyone. Um, it is such an honor to be here on this Sunday afternoon. It's been a cold but beautiful weekend in Maine and welcome. I know it's, it's hard to get to these Zoom things, but a lot of people are Zoom fatigue. And um, so we really appreciate that you're here. Um, you know, to, to, to Meg and to Catherine, um, thank you for inviting me to the Poets Corner and particularly to Catherine who I've worked with um, as a writing mentor for almost, I think, probably 15 years on and off. And so I'm deeply grateful to her and to be here um, to share work today. And Richard, who gets the Adele Award for most change since I last saw him. <laughs> I mean, my God, Richard, you look fantastic. We wanna always see you in a suit and tie. Um, okay, so I am here. Um, we're just gonna break this up. We're gonna introduce ourselves and then um, present for, you know, 10, 12, 15 minutes a person, and then we'll get into sort of a round table discussion. But I'm here to talk about my deep love, deep love. My heart's pitter pattering right now of books. And I know that everyone on this Zoom feels the same way. I mean, I think most of us grew up as kids, you know, it, with a deep um, sort of connection to books, they became a place we escaped to. They showed us a different world. They showed us places that we couldn't get to or that we would get to one day. Um, you know, I always think of uh, a, a great book, a bit like, um, you know, a great piece of art uh, that after you've read it or experienced it, you're somewhere a little bit different. You're forever changed. And I once made a map in my book binding classes of all the books that have changed my life. And I highly recommend it. It's this beautiful document from my, you know, from the age of 10 through to the age of 47, you know, which books have changed my life. And I think that's sort of a, an extraordinary document to own. So I encourage, that's your homework tonight. Um, so I love all books. I love artist books, which are sort of limited edition, you know, um, typically under edition of 50. Um, I love uh, zines, uh, so they're sort of Xerox books I love that are stapled. Um, I love trade books. 
um, that are the more traditional books that we buy from our booksellers, um, and, but also self-published books, more on-demand books, but you know, using like conveyor. So I have a love of, of all books um, and I love them for the tactile quality. I love them for the smell. I love them for the feel of the pages. I love taking them to bed. When I had no money, um, no money, I would go to, and when I moved to Maine in 1999, I would run to Tim's bookstore in uh, Rockport and basically just I earned very little at the workshops, but I gave it all, pushed it all across the table to him and would come home with a couple of new books a week. Um, and I would sleep with them. They really informed, you know, I couldn't afford to buy artwork. Um, books are so wonderfully democratic. That's why I love them. And I think as photographers, and I know we're a lot of writers here today, but photographers and writers are natural home for our work is in books. I mean, more so than any visual art medium, I think there's a real connection with photography and books. Um, so what I would do is for many years I worked before I knew how to book bind, I would just work in these sort of accordions and I would cut out my contact sheets from the dark room and I would write in them. And I would mm. write text and image. And I would, when I was waiting for the bus, when I was doing something or other that, you know, I wasn't supposed to be doing, I would like write in these. And it was a way I could take my work with me always, right? So, mm -hmm. I, and I have hundreds of these now and they're not precious, but they are these sort of source books where all the things I'm listening to, the things I'm inspired by, um, the things that I'm cooking, every, they all sort of go into this one place, this sort of bucket, if you will. Um, and then one day when I was uh, in 2002, when I was about to move to Boston to teach photography at the Art Institute of Boston in the BFA program, the teacher who was teaching visual books um, got a full-time gig elsewhere. And of course, as an adjunct, you have to take the full-time gigs. So my boss at the time said, you're gonna teach visual books. And I <laughs> said, okay. And I had literally, I was like, I was one step ahead of the students. So the night before I had to teach a particular binding, I was learning it myself, but I pulled it off, you know, never let them show fear. Is that someone's great advice to me once in teaching. And I pulled it off because I loved books. And I do think I was sort of always drawn to, um, to, to, to make books as a way of mark making. Um, so then that grew into uh, teaching uh, visual books at you know, workshops and I taught it at the AIB for 10 years. And I will say this, even if you never plan on making books, you don't think you're very ambidextrous, you feel like, oh, I can't cut a straight line. I promise you can be taught that, I promise you. But to even consider every element that goes into a book form, which book binding, learning how to book bind does that, the color of the type, the size of the type, the size of the page, the feel of the paper. The more you consider those forms for your work, whether your text and image or just one or the other, same thing. If you're writing a poem about a secret, do you want it to be in black ink? Maybe you want it to be in the palest of ink. I once had a student who um, rendered her PhD thesis, um, which was, I can't remember how many pages it was, but she put it into seven point type because oh. conceptually she felt it had been a, like this waste of so many years. And so she wanted to, so the form, do you see what I'm saying here? The form is now mirroring the content. So I would urge you to sort of think about classes that you could do, even if you never, you then you get a trade book, but just to sort of know what you have to consider for each step of making books. Um, so I'm, uh, I have worked with Richard, um, on my latest book, actually Richard guided me through something very scary. My last book, um, my fourth book, um, I not only had text and image, I also, um, did the illustrations and I am not an illustrator by anyone's stretch of the imagination. And I remember writing to Richard one night saying, oh no, I, you know, I can't do this. I can't, you know, I don't know how to watercolor. And he said, he said one line back growth is hard. And I, roared. <laughs> I, burst out laughing and I was like, oh, you bastard, I would have said that to you, you know. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to say I'm deeply grateful for Richard for how he has mentored me and pushed me further in this, this body of work. Um, you know, I think it's just a really, uh, all books and um, I'm working right now also on a, um, e uh, a limited edition artist book with Tupons Press that is sort of very different from a trade book. So we can talk at the end, you know, the differences and why you would go well, one route or the other. But what I'm gonna do right now is show you a couple of um, images from Blue Violet 
Um, Blue Violet, I'm going to talk while we go through it. And then I'm going to actually show you the book because I finally have a copy. And so I want to like hold it like I've been sleeping with it. And I took it to Hannaford's to see if I could see anyone there that wanted to see it. Um, so I'm proud of it. All right. So um, Blue Violet. So Blue Violet grew out of um, a my one of my best friends got sick with leukemia and she was um, she basically she basically spent two turns at Dana-Farber where she um, was sort of confined to one room, like a bubble, if you were a very sterilized room. And slowly what was happening, um, they they sort of took away her, her senses, like food was pureled, I'm sorry, food was sealed and uh, came in containers from Cisco. Um, and, you know, all the services were, had to be metal and pureled. There was no fresh vegetables, no fresh flowers, um, everything, you know, so slowly, um, it, she, the only sense that she was really allowed fully was music and she listened to it at the sort of the, the highest volume. Um, so she would say to me, you know, send me pictures. And so I wasn't going to send her, she was a tough critic of mine, so I wasn't going to send her something sort of mediocre or, or sort of like depressing. I sent her, I went, it was summertime in Maine, the first time she was there, and I went outside and I made pictures. I made pictures that were sort of riotous and full of colour and full frame and exploding out. And I knew I I would print these um, for bleed. I didn't want there to be any border. I didn't want it to be contained. And each day she would say to me, send me more, send me more. And so in a way, it was a way for her to access nature as a salve, which so many of us use nature in that way, um, but also color and taste. So slowly this book developed. I didn't set out to plan um, on making this book, but it made itself as you know, what happens, I think, with with sort of all art, if we're paying attention. Um, and I put together this book that is full of poetry. Uh, <coughs> I think of myself as a prose poem or a short form sort of essay rather than a poet. Um, that's just language. Um, but it has recipes, it has playlists, it has photographs, it has drawings. Um, and I'm going to read a couple of the, uh, the short form um, vignettes for you guys today, um, but you'll have to forgive me if uh, I've actually never read uh, on Zoom and I've only read in public twice. And I know it's an art in itself, the performance of, of spoken words. So do forgive me. I'm gonna try not to get my poet voice on. I'm just gonna try and just read it to you. Um, but this will be the first reading actually from uh, Blue Violet. So these um, illustrations that you're seeing here, are, you know, these are the, I wanted it to be my hand. Um, and originally I was thinking, well, maybe I will hire someone to illustrate the book, but it felt like that was a cop out, that it was this time where, you know, the pictures and the words and the illustrations, they didn't have to be perfect. Um, ooh, so uh, the screen is frozen. See, this always happens to me when I zoom. So I'm going to, all right, Rich, can you see if I can, uh, there we go. There's a riotous one. Um, and, uh, so I'm gonna read while I show these, um, these last few photographs. And also I'm gonna show you the book and talk a little bit about the considerations of the design and why I'm so proud of this particular book. This is a mind map. Um, this is the way I work. Uh, in, and if you've studied with me, I'll sort of, you know I get to, you to make these two. This is sort of an interior map of what was going on in my head. Everything I could think of around flowers, metaphor, symbol, light, color, type, Okay, Rich, if you could stop my share, is that possible? Can you do that? Great, perfect, here we go. Okay, so then here's the book in person in real life. Ooh, um, it feels very, very exciting to hold because um, you know, they, I always say an I, ISBN number is only once. Um, and uh, you know, the, it feels weighty, this book. It's a little different than my other books in the sense that it's larger. It's twice as big in terms of content and size. Um, and then this wonderful moment here ee, where it's hot pink. Yeah, it really, that's, you know, whenever I feel sad, I just do that. Um, so, you know, a couple of things that I thought about in terms of the design, I knew that I wanted this book to be full bleed. I wanted it to feel riotous. I wanted it to not feel constrained. Um, but it was, I also wanted this thing called a French fold. Now a French fold, 
can't open it here, is actually where the closed edge is out. Most in Western binding, you have the open edge out, so a regular page. This, now I can't seem to open it, I'm gonna lick it, because that's what you can do with books. You can't lick a PDF, but you can lick a book. So the closed edge is out. And what actually that changes a lot, because it changes the weight of the pages. Because this book is about the senses, right? So I want you to feel it. I want you to feel the way you move through a page and feel the thud, to feel it and to smell it. When you have full blue bleed and this much ink, it has a particular smell to it, right? Um, so it's a mix of, of text and image, as I mentioned, um, short form poetry, lists, emails, um, uh, recipes, I'm trying to think of it, it's sort of based on, it's sort of a modern day um, language of flowers, uh, which is, was really fun to, to write, you know, what's the modern day equivalent of laugh out loud or be right back. Um, anyway, so this is out in May 2nd. So this is the, I just received, this is an early press copy. Um, and it was a real joy. There were many things that were scary on press and I couldn't go on press because of COVID. So I didn't sleep for about two weeks and I was having like nightmares about, you know, color and things like that. And, but it all worked out in the end. Okay, so I'm gonna read you two pieces. Uh, the first is about the greenhouse and the second is about the bedroom. In the dark, I see all the problems. At 2 a.m., the clock ticks, marking time like little cut, cut, cuts. In St. Petersburg, during the siege, a metronome would sound out over the radio to let people know they were not alone. My mind is hoarse. I take my pillow and I walk downstairs through the kitchen, still fragrant with last night's dinner. Coriander, nutmeg, clove, and cinnamon. Warm orange smells that settle into the dark. I go out the back door and down the garden path. Entering the greenhouse is like falling into the ocean in August. The air is swollen and fertile. It smells of soil and sex, hot pink geraniums and thyme suspended. Pink is a touch. My fingers are exhausted. I climb onto the potting table with its mattress of petals and lay down facing the sunrise as if it's an altar before me. I believe in sound. I believe in the air being this stamp and what that does to sound, as though someone's turned the volume down to one. Condensation on the window reflects an orchestra of little me's reclined upside down in each circle. As the sky paints me orange, I breathe in the half light, the tiniest drops of water. I breathe in the sunrise, the sigh of the morning dove close by. I sleep as flowering violets grow from my eyes. A greenhouse is a fortress. Okay, the next one is um, about the bedroom. I empty the bedroom of all the furniture, except the bed, and invite the flowers to come and sleep with us. I need the oxygen. The room, this room is large with a vaulted ceiling. The walls are painted the palest green. The bed is opposite the south facing window overlooking the forest and the river. It's a terrible room to be sick in because it's too bright and there are no curtains. It's always warm in here too. Our neighbors are the trees. We're all naked together in the winter. I place the plants along the windowsill like a line of sheet music. Each note has a purpose. Fragrant lavender and gardenias to sing me to sleep. Seven paper whites whispering taller and taller against a January sky, filling this room with story. Trailing ivy filters out chemicals and mops up the moisture to make sure there's no mold and a single red amaryllis sits on the nightstand because everyone knows sex dreams are the best. And of course, my pink flowering azalea tree shakes me by the shoulders each morning to remind me that this world is not beyond repair. The definition of an optimist is someone who wakes up happy. So there we go. So I'll just show you a few, um, a few of the, you know, a few of the spreads. Sequencing, um, when I'm making my work, I, uh, uh, you know, this is my home studio I'm in right now. Um, but when it comes, and I would do everything, and I love the collision of art and life and making a soup, which kitchen's right there, you know, and coming up here and sort of thinking about an image or writing something. However, when it comes to um, 
putting a book together. I have to work in a completely empty room full of, um, you know, just little uh, pictures. I write the text. It's very analog. I write the text on a piece of on pieces of paper. I write. I print out the photographs and then I align it all up. And I'm there for months trying to find the right sequence. It's the right puzzle and it's not easy and there's no way around it but for me I'm the only one that that can do that part so um okay so that's what I wanted to share with you today thanks so much for listening and I'm gonna pass it over to Meg thank you so much Sig that is so wonderful I've loved your other books and I can't wait for this one I I see it in the chat it shows us that, uh, where to reorder it on your website or pre-order it on your website. I love, I've always loved your images and the intensity of them, of the color and form, but your language, you just boil it down to the essence of language. It's, it's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So sharing um, this platform with both Sig and with Richard is, is really a pleasure for me. And um, my book is a very different kind of book that I wanna share with you today. It's called Letters from the White Queen, but similar to Sig, I, I love books and I love this book. Richard Wright Smith designed it uh, working with me. And I um, am thrilled with so many of the choices, this gorgeous red cover and some of the end papers are beautiful. In fact, I'll, I'll share my screen for in just a second and give you a sense of the book. Um, but the book really honors my mother. And my mother wrote me letters in 1969, my first year away to college in that first semester. And she kind of she poured her heart out in these letters and she told me to save them. And I did, and I forgot about it. She died two years after that. And I didn't discover the letters for another 10 or 15 years. And I discovered them in this beautiful carved wooden box. And I've always wanted to do something with them. And I started writing poems and poems about my mother and in response to the letters. And I decided I wanted to make this book with excerpts of her writing with her voice and my poems. And that's how it came together. And then I think um, I'm gonna share my screen here for a minute. Um, and then part of it really came together when Sal Taylor Kidd took a look and she said, you know, you might want to look at Emily Dickinson's Gorgeous Nothings. And this is a, a beautiful book it, and it's her envelope poems. And they actually reproduce the envelopes. And she said, you might want to look at sharing the letters themselves. And that's kind of how some of the form evolved, the end papers have the actual envelopes where she wrote things like share mail and scare mail and beware mail on the envelopes. And then throughout there are quotations from her, there's some family photographs and there are reproductions of the letters themselves. And I'll go, you know, the end papers at the end are also these letters. So. I really am so grateful to Richard for his work with me in the design of the book. And I'm gonna share with you today just three poems, two from the book and one that is thematically similar, but is, is a newer poem. So the first poem that I'm gonna read is called Moonshot. Moonshot. The summer men landed on the moon. I launched from my family in Connecticut, drove 2,452 miles with my friend Candy in her car named Mortimer and landed at Reed College in Portland, Oregon under a cloud of drizzling August rain. Letters from home were already waiting for me and more arrived daily 
with men on the moon stamps, planting our flag 238,900 miles away from Earth. Perhaps I needed to be that far away to keep myself from getting pulled back in by the gravity of my mother's letters. Air mail, fair mail, share mail, fair mail, scare mail, beware mail. Always sign the white queen after the character in Alice's Wonderland who befuddled would believe each day six impossible things before breakfast. Like my mother, the impossible demon she fought with a pot of coffee, two packs of cigarettes, daily doses of Valium, on torn steno paper, red pen, red ink, she scrawled her heart out, wrote of my sister trying to fit into skirts I'd left behind, of my brother visiting dear Dr. Dulick twice a week to treat depression and dodge the draft, of battles with my father desperate to find herself. She told me daddy didn't think she should have let me go so far away. But sometimes she wrote, you have to cut the cord again and again and again. She told me to save her letters. Each one got darker. My tears welled up, black ink, blurred words. I didn't understand until years later, nothing a 17 year old girl could do but fly to the moon or head back home again. And the second poem I'm gonna read is called uh, Sandpiper's Waltz. And the excerpt from my mother's letter goes, Dear Meg, Jane and I have a date to go to the ocean November 11th. She has a day off, barring a nor'easter. If there is a nor'easter, we will build a fire in our fireplace. Sprinkle sand and sand dollars all over the floors and let the sink run over to get the feeling of the waves. Love, WQ. She signed every letter, either the White Queen or just WQ. Sandpiper's Waltz, part one. Afternoon sun dazzles, the sandpiper's waltz. The sea draws back and the long-legged birds follow, then tease the turning tide back to the dunes. We mimic the dance, my sister and I, tiptoeing out to follow the sea, tripping backward as the surf chases us to shore. My mother and her friend Jane chopped fresh tomatoes and zucchini, saute tiny bay scallops, and sip glasses of wine, watching our dance through a window. After the dishes are washed and dried, we build a fire on the beach under a smattering of stars like ratatouille spread across an eggplant night sky. Burnt marshmallows on sticks, Hershey's chocolate and graham cracker s'mores, Sticky smiles and sticky fingers washed up before bed. In bed that night, I listened to the murmur of friendship over the rhythm of the waves and drift off to dream of ballerina sandpipers tiptoeing across the stage. The Sandpipers Waltz Part Two. It's 47 years since my mother died. I'm staring at a dusty sculpture of a sandpiper, clay body balancing on skinny legs. Across the table, Jane sits, her gnarled hands wrapped around a coffee mug for warmth. I listen to a story she's told so many times before, how she met my mother who was sketching wildflowers my brother in his carriage asleep, 
Jane walked by pushing a stroller, her husky named Kovac on a leash. Beautiful dog, my mother said. After Jane moved on, she halted. And my mother said, wanna go get ice cream? Jane's roomy blue eyes light up as she tells me. And thus began one of the great friendships of my life. I see on Jane's wall the bark cloth my mother brought back from New Zealand. An old farmer's cross saw hangs over the door, a housewarming gift my mother and father brought on their first visit to the barn. Outside the window, chickadees hop on and off the feeder. We lost her much too early, Jane says, and nod. She stares at her coffee, then reaches for my hand. Many people never have a friendship like that. I was lucky. The cobwebs have gathered where I look for a pan to cook our dinner. In the room upstairs where I make up my bed, there are acorns on the blankets. Jane will never leave this old converted barn with the clay sandpiper, the cross saw, the photographs collecting dust, the musty scents and sweet memories, and all the ghosts of love that come to visit. You know, Jane, um, Jane died just shortly after I wrote that poem and it was from my last visit with her and, and they read it at her memorial service. I was so honored by that. So the, the last poem I'm gonna read and share with you today is a, a more recent poem and uh, I submitted it to uh, a poetry contest uh, from the Poets Society of Vermont and it won a runner up prize, which I'm very <laughs> pleased with sort of, um, I'm new at this sending work out. So it's, uh, it's always a trepidation for me. So this poem is called Her Skates. I picture my mother perched at the end of a dock, her skates, now mine, kicking into the air, her arms reaching to the sky in joyous anticipation of gliding across the ice, spinning, smiling, skating in crisp wintry air. In my twenties, I skated on river ice so black I could see leaves float downstream beneath my feet. Thick ice at the edges, open water in the center channel. We cut our marks on polished mirrors, believing our lives would last forever. I lace up my skates, her skates, with torn white leather toes. New laces replace old knotted ones, too frayed to support my older ankles unaccustomed as I am now to standing on a single sharp edge. I walk onto the pond, conquering fears of falling by conjuring her joy until I am sailing, arms spread wide, sidestepping leaves, cracks, bubbles in the uneven ice, feeling the past slide by on each single glide of the blade. Okay, Rich, can you stop share screen for me? There we go. You're not, you're not share screen. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Um, that book I produced as a very limited edition uh, signed copies and um, uh, just 50 copies. And I have a few few left between 10 and 15 and they are available on the Poets Corner shop on the Poets Corner website. So, and now I get to turn it over to Richard Wright Smith. Richard. Thank you, Meg. 
I'm sharing my screen here. Can you all see those B words? Okay, great. Um, thank you, Meg. Uh, thank you, Sig. Thank you, Poets Corner. Um, as Sig and Meg have been talking passionately about their books, it's, um, it's really no wonder. Um, books are so important for so many reasons. And if, you, if you've ever um, seen interviews with Joseph Campbell or read The Power of the Myth, um, there are archetypes throughout cultures that are ingrained in each culture with, without um, one knowing, you know, having contact with the other. And a book, I, this is my theory, <laughs> a book um, um, is one of those archetypes because um, if, if you just research the word, and this is the etymology of book, it's in German, in um, all these other languages, it means wood, or it means beech, beech wood, or um, birch wood, or ash in Sanskrit, all related to wood. And wood is the thing that sort of separated man from the other animals with fire. And, oops, let's see. Uh-oh. I'm trying to turn the page here. There we go. Um, whoop, too many. There we go. Um, and here's a very sort of condensed 2000 year history of books. Um, the first known um, book is from the Etruscans um, way back in 600 um, uh, BC. And then uh, up to Gutenberg um, and that time period where printing uh, became uh, invented and available. And then it was sort of, you know, mass produced books. Before that, there were only 30,000 books in all of Europe. And then it was just like wildfire um, once printing took place over the next um, 200 years. And this is the the first printed book with movable type. It's Gutenberg's uh, 42 line um, Bible, uh, 100, uh, 1,286 pages. Um, so each, the importance of this is that each letter was hand set. And prior to that, it's a lot of work up front, but prior to that, each book had to be handwritten. And that's why there were only uh, 30,000 books because it was so, so time consuming. Um, but even though movable type um, is time consuming up front. Once you have it set, you can print multiples of it. That's the, the beauty and the ingenious of his invention. Um, and in preparation for this, um, I found that the smallest book is um, 70 microns by 100 microns. And it's um, engraved on or etched onto um, silicone. In, um, in a microchip. And so it's, you can't see it with the human eye. You can see the, the microchip with the human eye, but you can't see the engraving. You have to put it on your computer. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping that there's collectors out there who are in the market for books you can't see because I have many, many books that, that you can't see. <laughs> Um, and this is, I found so interesting. This is the largest book in the world. Um, there's over 700 of these slabs that are carved and each one is three feet by five feet. And each one has their own housing, their own temple. And it's all surrounding this uh, pagoda in Myanmar. Uh, so I thought that was quite lovely. And then we get into my work. This is one of the first books that I made, but at the time I was in graduate school as a graphic designer and I didn't really think of this as a book because we sort of approached it as prototypes for 
mass printed, you know, many multiples of things being printed. So this is a prototype. Uh, it's the history of illumination. And I had gone to Ireland uh, right before starting graduate school and saw the Book of Kells. And it was just, you know, one of those moments where the sky opens and um, the light shines on you and you you feel enlightened. And it was quite a uh, an experience, you know, to be so near to that sort of history and that sort of craft. And it was just a beautiful experience. Um, and that led me into thinking about books and um, making books. And I found the Center for Book Arts in New York. And this is the first edition book that I made. Um, it's a collection of phobias that begin with the letter A. And um, you, uh, this one, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. Um, this one is agoraphobia. So I'm trying to typographically convey the meaning of the words. Um, and so agoraphobia is fear of open space. So this is very large, very tiny type, but very large open space. So if you have agoraphobia, you might be a, a little, it might make you feel a little tense. Um, and alorophobia is fear of cats, and amiophobia is the fear of the wind. And this, um, for anyone making a book, do not skip the step of making a book dummy. You, you gain so much information, um, both for yourself and for others looking at your idea, make a, a book dummy. So this is the book dummy um, that I made in 1996 for this first book. And um, this is a little closer up. You can see the, the type here. And uh, arachnophobia, too, is a spread in that book. And this whole book was, I, I was learning about letterpress printing. And so I took this opportunity with this book to sort of each spread learn a different technique of um, letterpress printing. And this is an edible book. Um, and at the time, I didn't know who Thomas Reed was, but um, I realize now that he is a famous um, or maybe infamous uh, main um, legis legislator, congressman. Um, and this is uh, one of his sayings. He was known as the, um, uh, the czar uh, uh, um, and had quite a reputation in Washington, D.C. in the mid-1800s. But uh, this is a, a famous saying by him, politicians never open their mouths without subtracting from the sum of human knowledge. And this is a seven course meal, all in uh, tarts. And it starts with, um, you know, sort of an, an appetizer and then goes through um, a, a crab, tarts, uh, uh, um, leek, quiche, mince pie, uh, cheese course, and then a, a dessert. Um, and then it came with some very nice wine too. Um, and I had, after um, leaving New York to come to Maine, I had this very nice quiet life um, over uh, in Camden and was doing freelance graphic design and I, saw this advertisement one day for a residency right around the corner at main media workshops and I was like oh I'm gonna apply for that but what am I gonna what am I gonna submit so I went back through all my sketchbooks and I found this thing that I had written 20 years ago 25 years ago and it was this collection of um alliterative haikus, um, all representing e each a letter of, an al of the alphabet. So um, an abecedarian is an alphabet book. And I'll just read um, a couple of these. I don't know if you can see some of them, the alligators. Um, all alligators ate apples and artichokes, antelopes applaud. And then we have the frogs. Uh, fearlessly, the fly flew off the farm from the frog, 
far from the frogs to the forest fern. And then the whales, as wind and waves waft, wiggling walruses wrestle, whales writhe in water. So this was such a joy for me to get this uh, residency. And it was the first year that Maine Media had offered uh, the residency and I shared it with Valerie Kerrigan. And it really opened, you know, meeting her and meeting all the people here at Maine Media has just opened this world of book arts to me beyond, you know, just as what I had known as a graphic designer. And it's been um, just life changing. And the time that I spent here um, doing the residency, uh, people would stop in and, you know, they would sort of see what I was doing and they came, um, let's see. Uh oh. Um, and this was a, another uh, project that I did in follow up, which is also a haiku, but um, instead of children's oriented, this is a little more adult oriented. And it's um, the life of the leaf. And it takes, um, there's 12 um, loosely editioned mono prints, if that <laughs> can be a possibility. Um, but all done with a jelly plate. I figured out a way to make uh, jelly plates um, in an addition um, so that there, this is an addition of 10. Um, and the each print corresponds with a haiku. And as I was starting to say, um, I got these out of order. Um, when I was at the residency here at Main Media, the studio, um, people started to see that I can make boxes, I could, you know, make marbled paper. And so people started um, asking me to help them with projects and, and SIG was one of the first people to give me a box commission, box making commission for running towards us. And, and so then it became sort of this idea of, um, you know, collaborating with people or people coming to me with um, with ideas for books. And this is Janet, Janet Gold. Um, she came to me and said, I, I have this collection of books. I want to do, um, you know, an online publisher printer. And so um, she had the, the poetry and we worked and created um, this book that I created in design files and uploaded to um, create space um, and with this lovely illustration by uh, Linda Funk. So it became, books are rarely um, a solitary venture. You, you're always trying to find someone who has this bit of information or ideas about this and paper and printing techniques and a lot of different things. So it's been a great community. Um, and then Rebecca Goodale, who I was a TA for at Haystack at one point, uh, recommended me to Dudley's Up, who lives up the road and in Lincolnville and is a wonderful um, artist. She had, you know, this amazing artwork and writing that she wanted turned into um, uh, an edition book. And from that, um, I met Lauren Henkin, and she was collaborating with Kamiko Han on a, a, a box set, her photography and, and Lauren's photography and Kamiko's um, poetry. And she needed someone to do the letterpress printing and create a box um, for this. And um, she only needed one. <laughs> she only needed one copy created. Um, so this is a photo of the uh, prototype that I um, created because um, she had already pre-sold it. She sold the idea, and they only wanted one copy. So 
that's sort of rare to do one book, but I do do that for mainly for my own work. Um, this is an edition of one, and it's a series of uh, jelly plate prints, which is a a very sort of lowly printmaking technique where you're using um, a slab of jello basically and brayering ink onto it and using stencils. Here I'm using uh, natural leaf stencils and layering colors. Um, and then they're pasted together um, on Japanese paper and this folds up like a map. And it um, was in, I had done the prints and then I found this amazing poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And then again, this sort of became uh, recurring uh, te techniques for me and themes. And I was very unsure of my own writing and still am, but um, I found other poets work that I could marry my work with. And this is um, a series of uh, prints that I thought went well with a poem by Helen Hay Whitney. And these next few slides and where I'm getting toward the end of my presentation, but I wanted to just sort of reflect back and sort of talk about what I'm doing now and why I'm doing it. During the, the pandemic, I, I realize when there's this chaos in the world, I sort of revert back to um, these abstract expressionist sort of um, brushwork. And in 2001, I was living in New York City and this is, I started this series of paintings after 9-11. Um, and I was basically taking refuge out on um, Long Island in Sag Harbor and um, just really sort of tuning, tuning out of the world and um, just doing a lot of paintings and brushwork like this. And then 2008 came around, the economic downturn from that. And same thing again, there's sort of this recurring style that I revert to when there's trauma in the, in the world and um, around me. So um, I'm working here with um, very um, simple ink and wash and just feeling, you know, listless and um, you know at the mercy of of the world um, when things like this happen and this is a, a more recent piece um, this is uh, a lot of brushwork and I've been experimenting with um, different types of, of brushes experimental brushes and this is uh, pigmented methyl cellulose which is um, a glue um, on paper but it um, it has a little bit more of a translucency to it. So, um, and this, I always like to leave um, people with this. Um, if you want to bring, bring a poem to life, write it down. If you want to make it eternal, print it. And I, I find that so true. And it's, you know, brings us all back to why we have books and the way that we as humans convey and have a history. But I don't know who this um, saying should be attributed to. So if anyone ever comes across it, please let me know who, who said this. So thank you. And stop sharing. Richard, thank you so much. That was so great. and. You know, you are so generous in helping other people birth their ideas and, and their work and all that. And it was just such a delight to see more of your own creativity today. Thank and you. as well as what you taught us about this whole field of books in a very short amount of time. So thank you. Sure, you're welcome. That was great. Pleasure. So I think at this point, we'll, we will kind of look for 
um, some questions that we might have of each other as well as field some questions from the chat um, in just a general discussion about choices and um, options and things like that. You want us to put questions in the chat? Yes, if you would, that would be great. And I noticed that there was one question, and I think that was uh, to Richard. Um, how do you preserve gelatin prints? Do you need tissue between the papers? Kind of a technical issue. Yeah, that, no, that's fine. It, the, it depends on the, the ink that you're using. I have used both um, Speedball uh, printmaking ink, which is very water, water soluble, and then screen printing ink that is not water soluble. And I'm printing on uh, regular bond paper, which is archival. And I really have had no trouble with them, you know, bleeding or sticking to each other. So I don't, um, I don't, you know, put anything between them. And there's somebody else asking, is there a size of book that's most popular? I noticed Sig talked about the decision to make this new book much larger than the other. Is there reasons to make a decision about the size of a book? Is that for me or for Sig? You know, I, I think it was to any of us. So I would love to hear you answer it and have maybe Sig to ask about that specific decision and you to answer in generally is there. Uh, sure, for me, um, when I'm designing a book, it has to do with the size of the page because you want, you want to design it so that you get the most, you want to be the most efficient and get the, the most number of pages out of a sheet and that can help dictate the size. For a lot of online printers, um, they have preset sizes that you have to conform to. And that's for the similar reason, the size of their presses, the type of binding that you're doing and the sheets of paper that they're doing. Um, and, but if you're, you're printing here, um, we're limited to the size on the letterpress um, or you know, the uh, inkjet printer. Um, and those are the types of things that, that dictate. Um, but I've seen huge books um, at Colby. They have a double elephant folio of um, James Audubon's uh, Birds of America, which is huge. <laughs> so it beyond, beyond technical limitations, it's imagination limitations. And Richard, when you said here, you're referring to the Book Arts Studio. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm broadcasting from yeah. <laughs> studio, main media. Just wasn't sure everybody would know that. Yeah. Sig, I'd be really curious to know about your decision in this case or decision. Um, you know, I think it, it comes down to this idea of the avenue of books, right? So there's, you know, trade books where you have to consider, you know, that the, they're mass produced. And so you're limited, you know, in terms of, um, of, of sort of a paper type and, and, and that's, uh, and, and size, you know, it's unusual. I mean, some publishing houses that, you know, do the sort of an enormous books, but it's very rare and very expensive. Um, so that's what's so beautiful about the artist book and about one of a kind and about, you know, I would urge you to design the book around the content, you know, this idea of um, a book of secrets being tiny or a book about, you know, I mean, fill in the blank, right? This idea of the, the concept, you know, the idea of the book, you know, if you're making a book about your mother, what would you make it out of? You know, it's just these extraordinary decisions that you get to make um, when you're only making one or two copies. Um, so I would say that the size of the book is really important, um, but you definitely get less choices as you get some more into the, the print, um, into the trade printing side of it. And why did you decide to make this book twice the size of your other books? 
Um, you know, the book, my other books were square. I changed from shooting square to rectangle. So that was the first consideration. I wasn't going to crop in a different way. I wanted the work to, I wanted it to feel, the pictures to feel kind of overwhelming. I wanted the color to feel like you were having a feast. So it couldn't be a little book. That would be too precious. I wanted it to feel almost maybe suffocating. So it needed to be larger, um, but I also wanted it to fit in someone's hand. It's a very different experience if you need a table. I mean, Skip's got a book that is, I, I can't even remember who publishes, it, but it's its not a personal experience to read it, right? So can you take it to bed with you? Can you read it in the bath? You know, all of these things, how do you want people to engage with your book? Um, so I think, it, I think size is important for sure. Nice, thank you. We have a question for Richard here um, from Jeannie Mullen. Um, she says, I have always thought of a book being defined by having a binding. And I'm wondering why you referenced the Myanmar slabs around the temples books. I, uh, hi Jeannie. Um, I, a conventional book is bound. And that's sort of the conventional meaning of a book, but I take a wholly unconventional view that it can be whatever you want it to be. And I, I think just the idea of a book being something that houses something precious is, is fine and, and it can be open. Great, great. We have a, a question from Lisa Graves to all of us, I think. Just curious, what kind of strategies do you have when you feel like you need insight with your work? Hmm. If I understand the question right, I, I think I would respond by saying that, you know, I, I have readers that I trust and I trust to give me feedback on my work. So that's the first strategy that I have. Like, well, first I, I put it aside and I let it sit for a while and I come back to it and see how it feels and whether I have a different you know, approach to it or want to think about it differently. And then the second step might be to give it to somebody that I trust to give me honest, but generous feedback, you know, that somebody who I know has my best interests at heart that I'm, you know, not going to be just, oh, yes, it's, it's wonderful, or it's so critical that I can't hear it, um, which I'm sensitive to. So those are things. But then in the, the process of creating a book out of it, I got to say that that was a whole process with Richard and, and an ongoing one that, you know, I, I put some of my ideas out. He came back with some ideas that he had. I showed it to some other people and they, they suggested some other things. So it was an ongoing thing and that gave me lots of insights. So I'd be curious how you uh, answer that on your own work. You're so good at doing it for others, Richard. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I come at a project two ways. If um, I, I'm sort of always wearing two hats, artist, designer. And as a designer, I'm trained to communicate to the masses. And as an artist, I'm trying to express my personal concepts. So when I come to someone else's project, I need to sort of understand what they're trying to convey and communicate and then translate that into a book format. And it's always, you know, I'm always doing sketches and gathering reference material and gathering um, ideas. And, you know, particularly in those early stages, it's gathering information and understanding what possibilities could happen. Nice. Sig, where do you go for insight into your work? Um, you know, it's, I switch medium. So when, I, when I'm struggling with making pictures, like March is a tricky time for me in Maine, you know, it's like 
not much, not much happening out there. Um, it's the resistance, it's all underground. So um, I switched to writing and, and focus on writing a lot. And then in the summertime, I am photographing and, you know, um, so, and I also have different times of day. I write first thing in the morning. I've started doing the illustrations. I love doing them with music on, you know, at six o'clock in the evening, whereas normally I, I wouldn't, you know, so it really varies. I think um, when I get stuck in my, with my pictures, I, I have this trick that's like, you know, I go and I, I'm allowed to spend only $10, $20. And I go to like thrift stores and antique stores and I have to find like a Ouija board, the thing that pulls me. And then I have to make a picture with it that day. So it's a little bit trickery. And so just like some very basic things, but it does help me. I also like every, you know, um, have people who I share my work with and, um, you know, who give me feedback, but also that aspect of time you mentioned, Meg, I think is really important. Just letting it sit, particularly with writing. Yes. Um, we have a question or comment from Kathy Miller. I have prototypes and ideas, picture books of story, history, and poetry, mostly adult content, not child. How do I get it to the next level? Find this kind of community of helpers. From idea to print seems a huge jump in expensive. How to manage finding help, resources, making it happen. So I'm going to take a Dab at the first thing I would recommend is some of the classes at main media. <laughs> you know, so many wonderful workshops that, like the one Sig talked about, her book. What is it called? Visual books class. Um, yeah. I think it was called Visual Books for Photographers, but that was just to get photographers in it. It was totally <laughs> lying. You didn't have to do big pictures at all. In fact, you know, the strength of it was that you know photographers realize oh i have been collecting all this ephemera and all this like notes and stuff i mean hoarders where basically everyone on the zoom is a little bit of a hoarder you know there's a place for that now you found your people it's books you know and and richard is chair of the book arts program there and his program so many wonderful classes and there are writing classes there are writing groups and there are so many resources but I found that you know that workshop or that ongoing class for me gives me a jump start it gives me some tools and some inspiration to figure out where I'm going next did you want to say anything else about that Richard no, I, I was going to say the exact same thing. Okay. We have many, many amazing classes. And currently we have um, writing and illustrating a children's book, but there's people in that class who are doing a, books that are more adult oriented because you use pretty much the same process um, of thumbnailing and figuring it out and revisions and getting feedback. And it's from each other. So one, yeah. one thing I might add to that is that I think there's a tendency with your first books is to put everything in it. Like it's your life work, everything, you know? <laughs> and I think books are stronger when you um, take one idea and you design the whole book or the whole thought around one idea or one, one project, you know? I think um, otherwise, you know, you can end up with the greatest hits of photographs or greatest hits of, of, of um, poems. And I, I think that books, is, and we all know that with music, right? The greatest hits albums aren't as good as the, uh, you know, Purple Rain, you know, it's just, so thinking of it in that same way, it's not so different, even in the sequencing, you know, thinking about in terms of music, you know, the ballad was always number six. The one that made it to number one was number three. You know, there is this sort of lyrical, you can't be like fired at all the time. It's this sort of lyrical journey that you're taking people on. So I would say that sort of narrow around one idea. Um, in fact, in, you know, one of my classes, I have them make um, a whole book around one picture or one idea or one line of poetry. And then you're really taking the content into the form into, con you know, into content. Nice. Uh, another question for you, Sig, uh, is that daily book concept of yours a handmade piece and is there a best way to put those together? Um, do you mean my sort of uh, source books, journals? Is that? 
I think that's what yeah um it is it's a it's just a place where you put all your ideas because I think everyone I think you know when you put it all in one place you'll be surprised by how much everything is connected and it's this sort of this you know what you think is um uh this sort of synchronicity happens that the music you're listening to the books you're reading are all sort of linked in to these sort of more central themes and that helps identify it so it's not every day for me as soon as I say I'm going to do something every day I stop three days later so I try not to put date on the when I'm entering into it because then it starts to feel like a journal or you know a journal that I'm obliged to write in every day so it's more you know, it's more like I write down and I make pictures about the things I'm noticing. So in a way that's sort of like a, is that a day book? I don't even, I'm not even sure, but it, I do try and sort of, I do try and do it on a regular basis. Nice. Um, a question for me, how did I decide on the size of the book? It, it's kind of interesting because it's technically a chapbook. They say a chapbook is defined as the number of poems in a book. And typically a chapbook is like 25 to 30 pages and a full collection might be 40 to 60 pages, a full collection of poetry. And a chapbook tends to be around a single theme. And I don't think I have an example of a chapbook, but they're typically smaller. Yeah, I have one here. Uh, they're typically a smaller book and uh, five and a half by eight and a half and not a lot of when it's produced uh, by a publisher, there's not a lot of pictures, illustrations, it's more text. And um, in talking with it uh, over with Richard, I really thought of it initially as chapbook. And then it just really grew. <laughs> and I love it so much. I did have somebody, a publisher, offer to print it as chapbook. And I, I've just decided not to go that route because it needed the, it needed the space to really honor what I consider my mother's work in there. So it needed to be bigger. And then it was also confined with, you know, the size of the it was printed by conveyor and the sizes that, you know, conveyor offered, et cetera. So question from Sue, if a poet or a photographer is interested in exploring the book form for their expressing and showing their work, what would you suggest as the next steps or as the first step? And I, I think we kind of talked about that already a little bit. So thank you, Sue. I know you're, you're a wonderful book artist yourself and you've taken that first step and many more steps in that direction. Um, question about how self-publishing works. So, you know, when I first started uh, Letters from the White Queen, I was, working with a poetry mentor who advised me if I wanted to send it out for publication, then self-publishing would prevent it from being published. And I, I was still thinking I, I would send it out to be considered. And so he said, but if you did a limited edition book with no ISDN number and, you know, it, it's that kind of signed copies almost like an artist book, then that wouldn't prevent it from that. And so that's how I started with the self-published book. There are lots of venues for um, options for choosing the type of book and who to publish with and whether you know you can put the you can get an ISDN number and you can put it up for sale on Amazon and all that. So there are a lot of decisions that you can make with self-publishing a book. Uh, Richard, would you like to say more about that? Yeah, I just want to say um, finding a publisher is very competitive and you often, you know, if you're just starting out, you relinquish a lot of creative control to them. Um, and self-publishing, it's, you know, you're, you're paying for it but you're also in control of the creative 
aspect of it. So that those are, you know, things to weigh and consider. So, so many wonderful questions in the chat. I really love how, how people are engaged with this. Um, and, and Skip Klein had a, a wonderful comment about the size of the book. He said, with the book, you, the photographer or painter, can control the viewing distance by the size of the book. A really important comment. Um, one, one thing that I would add to, to that is that, um, you know, with my first book, Emergency, I made the mock-up. You know, I did it physically by hand. I also had a blurb book made, which was, um, sorry if anyone from Blurb is here, but it was a complete thud. It came through the same books, exactly the same content when it was with a designer and when it was me designing it through Blurb. It's like night and day. I can't even stress how, how um, you know, you, you, it's like you only know what you know, right? So I think you need, need, everyone needs to do this deep dive into book up binding, but then also realizing that book designers are really important. I've worked with, with the, my four trade books, I've worked with um, one person for the first three and now a new designer, um, Jeanette Abink for this last one. And it's been extraordinary. I mean, you know, it's, it's like a whole other profession in itself, but I still feel if you, it's like printmaking, if you don't know something's too magenta, you can't say add more green, you know? So you, it's having that language to then work with a designer. So I do think that, um, you know, working with a designer, whether you can trade off, find someone who does it, I think it's a really beautiful exercise. I have worked with one student, Norm, and he's a, um, retired uh, radiologist and I told him that he should work on his own you know design of a book and he was like well I'm not going to becoming a dentist you know I mean it, it is a different <laughs> professor profession but I think just understanding the basic principles I think gives you that knowledge to then work with a book designer whether you self-publish or you go trade. I love that advice and I, I gotta <laughs> say that I you know also knowing your own strengths I've, I've talked to Richard many times I am not a detailed person, <laughs> you know, and the, the some aspects of actually crafting a, a handmade book, I, I just would not be very good at. Yeah. But understanding it, you know, as you said, is, is huge. And so, um, yeah, it was wonderful to work with the designer. Um, so somebody, uh, Ian, it says, I always struggle between using fonts or handwriting in a book. Any strong feelings? Yes. Like, is your handwriting any good? I mean, <laughs> I mean it really comes down to that. Like, but yeah. also try writing. This is some advice that I was given much slower. You, no one's handwriting in any of these ha books with the beautiful handwriting. None of it's the script that they write their to-do list on. They, they work, typically work much slower. You know, I think people, I see we have Jan Owen on the line, like, well, I mean, gorgeous calligraphy, you know. It is not, it's a learned thing as well. So I would say that, you know, handwriting, you might naturally have amazing handwriting. I did not, so it was something I really have to work at, you know. So putting my handwriting in this new book was, with all the mind maps, was even terrifying, you know. Um, so, you know, you want your fonts, you don't, you know, it's a huge issue of fonts. I think nothing can sort of point to, or this person doesn't know what they're doing by using a certain font. You know, it can be a real, like walking out the house without your pants on or something. So, and I'm not a design, you know, Richard should take over from here. But I, it, I was going to say, there are so, so, so many fonts and you have fonts that look handwritten and you have fonts that, you know, have been crafted and molded in metal and have been used since the 1400s. Um, and the way that I approach typography is conceptually. What are you trying to say in your book? And fonts to me have a personality and they, they convey that either personality or concept throughout the book. And it, it's just a, a different way of looking at fonts. Just because something is called, you know, a font is called beautiful handwriting doesn't mean that it's going to be appropriate for your book. Um, you ignore the name of the font. That might be a clue, but you really want to look at the characteristics of 
the words that you're writing on a page, take that font. If you think it's something you're interested in, type out, type it out, your words using that font and see if it works either with your photographs or with whatever images. Um, it's, it's a process and an experimentation. I got to say, it was one of the hardest decisions and I didn't expect it to be, you know, and Richard ended up producing the letter excerpts and the poems in about, I don't know, 10 different fonts for, for us to like, see, what are they saying? What are they doing? You know, I didn't expect it was such a nuanced yeah. um, choice. And it's often you don't know what's the right one, but you know it's not that. So students right. will come to me and I'm like, nope, <laughs> nope, next. You know, it's like this. I know Sue and I have gone through that, but oh, no, not that one. It's just like, well, what about this? Like, nope. Um, I, so, yeah, it's really a, a str you know, it's like everything. Like, I love the t shirt. Art is hard, right? <laughs> yeah. An interesting question from Craig Stevens. With the facade of a cathedral like the Eglise de Saint Trophime in Arles, filled with glass relief sculpture, be a book or a visual event? Any opinions? A Richard? book. A book? Definitely. I want to go. I want to see it. <laughs> I want to experience it. Um, it could be. It could be any and all of those. I think. Really a lovely comment um, that, to me, but, but generally um, saying, do we, our generation, still write letters besides emails? The pandemic has had some good effects, such as reminding people of the beauty of letter writing. And I catch myself writing letters to old friends and receiving them in return do you write letters? And that is so wonderful because these letters from my mother are such a treasure. And, you know, I wouldn't have them in my emails. And I gave this book to my niece, niece and my two nephews and they got to see and know a grandmother that they'd never met, you know, or a family member. And I don't write letters enough. Not nearly enough. I started sharing a journal though this last year during the pandemic with my brother and it's electronic and it's in a Google Drive and he writes one day and I write the next and you know some days we go for a few days and I had it all printed out and gave it six months of a pandemic journal mm -hmm. and it was just so wonderful. I realized it was like writing letters. I send thank you cards. That's that's mm. about the extent of my letter writing. <laughs> hey, hey, letterpress printed cards, I might, might add. Okay, nice. <laughs> but also in a way, you know, texts are letters. I mean, that's beautiful too. It's, you know, it's not, maybe yeah. it's not exactly the same, but in a way um, it's a form of communication that's beautiful, you know, um, so. You know, it's 527 and we have some other wonderful questions in the chat. And I think what I will do is make sure that we save the chat and if possible, we'll get back to some of the people um, if they're direct questions. Uh, there's one to Richard about how, how, how do I come to you for advice and <laughs> it's some other very direct questions. and. I, we don't really have time for them right now, and uh, but I don't want to miss being able to answer those to, to different folks. I just want to kind of wrap up by saying thank you so much to Richard and to Sig. It's just wonderful sharing this Sunday afternoon with you. And thank you to all the people that came and provided such a lively conversation and discussion and being part of the Poets Corner community, um, which we love. Remind you to come back on April 11th for a very different kind of Poets Corner and uh, it should be very interesting as well. And um, Catherine, do you have any particular last words you'd like to share? 
Oops, she's muted. You may be muted. I think she's frozen. Oh dear. There. I, I so enjoyed this, and <laughs> it and it kind of makes me want to do something. <laughs> you know, do a little book or a little something because it's so intriguing and and fascinating. Yeah, the physicality of it and the beauty of it and the range of what you shared of, of what it can be. It's it's wonderful. Yep. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. thank you. Hi. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Meg. Thank, thank you, Stig. Thank, thank you, Richard. Hi, Greg. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> Technical support. Technical yes, support. Thank Have you. a good evening. Thank you. It was happy great. Sunday. Happy Sunday. Bye guys. Bye. Good to see you.